It is the prerogative of God alone to prescribe the duty of men and angels. The will of God is a perfect will and must be obeyed as it is set forth in his holy law because every requirement is just and is set forth by infinite wisdom. The law of God should be obeyed even though there were no authority to enforce it and no rewards for its obedience. The highest interests of men and angels are conserved in obeying the law of God. God's will expressed in his law is the supreme will and no invention, no device of men can take its place. Obedience to the commandments of men instead of to the commandments of God will be as abomination in the sight of God. For what God requires is essential to the highest good of his subjects and is therefore essential for the glory of God. Signs of the Times, September 24, 1894, paragraph 4. God is good. Uh, you always say it so weakly the first time. God is good. Still weak, but that's uh, okay. I'll accept it. And all the time. Thank you, sister. May the Lord bless you. Has God been good to you, yes or no? Yes. Well, God is good. God is good. Yes, God is good. All and all the time. Yes. Ooh, I'm exhausted. All right. How are you? Great. Nice to see you. God bless you. How was your week? Great. Good, good. You thank God for that. Yes. Did anyone have a very hard week? Can I see your hand? You're, okay, you had a hard week. You had a hard one? Just two? Okay, two is enough. But the fact that you're here means that God brought you through. Am I right? Yes. If you think your week was hard, you should go to the Bahamas. You know what a hard week was and continues to be. So please pray for the people in the Bahamas. There are many Adventists in the Bahamas. Pray for them very specially. A boat caught fire about a week ago off the coast of Southern California. I believe 35 people burned to death or they died from smoke inhalation. Their grieving family members remember to pray for them. We live in a world that is suffering. We're not always aware of it because we're okay. But there are people right now as I speak suffering, crying, hurting. And so let us always be sensitive to God's goodness towards us. Because there are many who would like to exchange places with us. With all the problems we have, there are thousands who would love to exchange places with us. And so I thank God for his goodness. Psalm 100 verse 5, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Who's with us today? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. You are with us for the first time. May I see your hand? First time, visitor. Second time. Third time. Fourth time. All right, sister, you're somewhere between third and fourth. What's your name? Le what? Levon. Spell it for me. Oh, Levon. And what's the last name? Joy. Where are you from, Sister Levon? Well, I'm born in Michigan. Michigan is a good place. <laughs> oh, you're still in. Okay, so you're Wolverine. Well, good to have you, Sister Levon. Who invited you? Uh, where is he? Oh, I guess he went to the back. All right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he shouldn't do that. He may come back and find another young man sitting next to you. All right. Well, we thank him for bringing you. Sister Levon, God bless your life and bless you so much that you become a blessing to others. Say amen for Levon. Anybody else? Okay. Ah, what's your name? Elena. Elena. Nice name. I have a friend called Elena. Where are you from, Elena? Uh, Maryland. Maryland. That's where you're from originally? And where do you live now? Ann Arbor, good place. That's where I live. Thank you very much for coming, Elena. Who invited you? You just came, led by the Spirit. Thank you, Elena, for coming. God bless your life. 
And may God grant you the deep desires of your heart. Say amen for Lena. Amen. Say amen for Levon. God is good. And all the time. And that's no joke, you know. God is a nice person. I like God. And I love him. I've told you that before. He is a nice person. And I like him. From time to time, just tell God that you like him, you love him. He will enjoy that very much. Let me welcome those of us or those of joining us via the internet, wherever you are. May the Lord bless your lives. And I hope the word ministering from this desk or ministered from this desk will be a blessing to you as it is explained to you by the Spirit of God. I thank God again for the high honor of being with my home church and the great privilege of speaking for him somewhere in the writings of Ellen White. I know I read that angels sometimes ask God to let them speak about Jesus. And God tells them, no, let sinners do it. And so I am very aware that in standing in a pulpit, I am occupying a position angels would love to occupy. And I thank God for that. And the only assurance I can give him is to give you, thus saith the Lord. Can you say amen? amen? Our subject for today, the personal side of prophecy. What did I say? The personal side of prophecy. As usual, if you're using one of these, make sure it does not ring. Mine is turned off as an example from the pulpit. Let me double check. So I'm not embarrassed, all right. And uh, mine is off. Make sure yours are off if you don't need them. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9 says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And favor number three, I want you to really think. Thinking is not something that you do automatically. It has to be deliberate. And so think as you listen. Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for life. We thank you today, God, for the freedom we have to come into your house of worship without molestation from the authorities. We thank you today, God, that while we do not have everything we would like, we're still greatly blessed. Accept our thanks, dear God. If we have sinned against you, forgive us, Father, and put into our hearts a hatred for sin, a bitter hatred for sin, that you may say of us, thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. It is my duty, Father, to explain spiritual things, and I'm a sinner. And so I ask you, Father, please help me. Grant me your spirit. He is the spirit of truth. Let him direct what I say, that only your words will leave my lips, that your people may be blessed. Remember those listening via the internet, wherever they are, bless them, dear God. Remember those who are suffering terribly from the devastation in the Bahamas. Father, be merciful to them, I pray. And the family members of those who were burned up in that ship off the coast of Southern California. Father, be merciful, Lord. Comfort the grieving, I pray. Remember the country of Zimbabwe who lost their founding father. Comfort those who are grieving his passing. Now, dear God, take all the glory and grant us the blessing, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's people say... Amen and amen. It is uh, 10 after 12. I'll release you before one. So that's about 50 minutes, maybe even fewer than that. Question for you. Have you ever heard of the time of the end? Say yes or no. Yes. Have you ever heard of the end of time? Yes. All right. Someone on this side. What is the time of the end? Too slow. That side. Both of you slow. Well, it's good to be of one accord. Now, let's try to understand the time of the end and the end of time because they are very, very important concepts to understand, especially if you are a Seventh-day Adventist. Now, this church is built on Bible prophecy. Are you with me? Great Controversy, page 409, paragraph 1. The scripture which above all others had been both the foundation 
and the central pillar of the Advent faith was the declaration unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. What the writer is doing is identifying Daniel 8.14 as the foundation stone of our theology. Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, I'm unable to go into the details, but for those of you who studied prophecy, you know that that period began when? No, when did it begin? When did the 2,300-day prophecy begin, that period? I think I heard it somewhere on this side. 457 BC, that's when it began. When did it end? October 22, 1844. Now, for those of you who look puzzled and stupefied, there is a long prophecy in the Bible. I feel like coming a little closer. Could someone put some life into one of those microphones for me? I just feel the urge to come a little closer to copy Elder Mark Brazell, anyone you like, the red one, the blood of Christ, yes. Thank you. The 2300-day prophecy began in eight, uh, 457 BC. It ended October 22, 1844. That is the longest time prophecy in the Bible. There is an erroneous teaching floating around the church, not particularly this church, but the Adventist church called the 2520. That is not a Bible prophecy not recognized by the church. Now, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. The sanctuary, of course, being that thing in heaven built by God, not by human hands. And by the way, there is a sanctuary in heaven, for those of you, again, who look surprised. There is a sanctuary in heaven, and it functioned as the pattern for the sanctuary that Moses built at the direction of God in the wilderness. It was also the pattern for Solomon temple and the temples that came after that. Now, I give you two expressions, the end of time and the time of the end. Let's go to Daniel 12. We'll read verse 4 of Daniel 12. Our subject, the personal side of prophecy. Daniel 12, we'll read verse 4. Do you have that? Let's read together. But thou, O Daniel, do what? Shut up the words and seal the book. Come, keep reading. Even till when? The time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Look at verse 9. What does verse 9 say? Read it for me. And he said what? Go thy way, Daniel. Why? The words are, and sealed when? Until the time of the end. Now. Follow me closely. There were parts of the book of Daniel that he could not understand. God sent Gabriel to help him. But he still did not fully understand. That is the part of the book that Daniel was told, seal it up. Because there are parts of Daniel we understand. And Ellen White is very clear, the little book that was sealed refers to that part of the book of Daniel that he could not understand. And the angel told him, understanding will come when? At the time of the end. Now, go to Revelation 10. Revelation 10, our subject, the personal side of prophecy. Revelation 10. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his face, and his face, and, and, and his face was as the word of the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Now, this mighty angel represents Jesus Christ. Rainbow on his head, face like the sun, feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his book, a little, in his hand, a little book opened. 
And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. Now this angel is the same angel we find in Daniel 12, 6 to 8. Same angel representing Christ. Now, let's go to verse 5 of, of Revelation 10. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein. Finish that verse for me. That there what? Should be time. Ah. Now we have no more time. And the first expression we found was time of the end. Let me say it again. There are two critical expressions in prophecy. The end of time and the time of the end. The time of the end began in 1798 at the end of the 1260 year period. Now you've heard of that. All right. Have you heard of the 42 months? Time, times, and half a time. They all refer to the same thing. A period of 1,260 years that began when? Five thirty-eight A.D. Ended when? Seventeen ninety-eight. That's 1,260 years. Now, in 1798, that is when the time of the end began. The end of time is the end of prophetic time. In other words, after 1844, October 22, there are no more prophetic time periods the Bible has for us. Let me slow down. Let me pray. Father, I haven't got time to go into details, and so you really have to help me and your people understand. Let the Spirit have his way, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1844, October 22, a prophetic period ended, which began 2,300 years earlier, back in 457 BC. That prophecy is first mentioned in Daniel 8.14. And the prophecy says, at the end of that period, the tabernacle or the sanctuary would be cleansed referring to the sanctuary in heaven. With that period, October 44, October 22, 1844, the end of time began. The time of the end began in 1798. Let me pause and quiz you. Oh, you're writing, ah, God bless you for that. When did the time of the end begin? When did the end of time begin? 1844, October 22. Meaning the end of prophetic time. No other prophetic time periods follow October 40, 22, 1844. So if you hear some Adventist preacher saying, well, in uh, 1987 this happened and something will happen in 2027, be very, very cautious. The last prophetic time period ended October 22, 1844. Now, the time of the end encompasses a lot of events. When you think of end time events, tell me, what comes to mind? The time of trouble, yes, my good sister. What else comes to mind when you hear end time events? Sunday laws, mm -hmm. let me talk about Sunday laws. What that sister means, there will come a time when Sunday will be made the legal day of worship in this country. Are you listening to me? Those who accept it will then have the mark of the beast. Nobody has the mark of the beast now. Are you following me? Because when you accept that man-made law against God's law, then you've chosen another God. What else comes to mind when you hear end time events? Persecution. What else? The change, okay, change, all right, change the Sabbath, uh huh. Anything else? Ever heard of the close of probation? There are some churches that preach when Christ comes back, you'll have an opportunity to change. No, no, no. Listen to me carefully. Go to Revelation 14 quickly. 
Let me try to correct that. God is good, and all the time, my friends listening via the internet, I hope you're following us. It is a challenging presentation, but I'm getting to the easy part. Maybe we should have a series of prophetic presentations at Ipsy, so you understand the foundation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. When you do, your entire attitude changes. What book did I say? Revelation, what chapter? 14. Read for me verse 14. What does the Bible say? And I looked and behold a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man. Keep reading. Describe him now. Having on his head what? A golden crown, and in his hand what? A sharp sickle stop. Revelation is a book of symbols. Now, what does this person have on his head? Who wears a crown? A king. Now, Jesus right now is serving as what? High priest. What does the priest do? He intercedes. Are you following me? Now, let's go to Leviticus 16 and see what the priest wore when he interceded. Leviticus 16. Our subject, the personal side of prophecy. It's 20 minutes after 12. Do you have that? What book did I say? What chapter? Read it from what verse? Four. Now this chapter is a critical chapter in the entire Bible because it deals with the Day of Atonement. The entire chapter. Another very serious chapter is Leviticus 23, which deals with all the seven feasts and the details connected to those feasts. Verse four. And he shall do what? Put on the what? And what? Shall have what? The linen breeches upon his flesh and shall be girded with the linen gird. Now end verse 4 for me. And with the linen mitre shall he be attired. Where was the mitre worn? On the head. It's a, it's a head covering. The priest wore a mitre. But what is this person wearing who's sitting on the cloud? A crown. Now it's the same person. What John is seeing in Revelation 14 is the coming of Christ not as a priest, finish my words, as a conquering king. Once he leaves the holy place and he takes off that mitre, all intercession ceases. Listen to me carefully. The time to get ready for Christ, tell me when, now. When he comes, there is no, there's no opportunity. When God sent Noah to warn the antediluvians, a flood is coming, a flood is coming. He preached for how long? 120 years. Virtually nobody listened. We're told in Genesis 7 verse 16, and the Lord shut him in. Did God reopen that door? No. When God shut Noah in, he also did something with that same action. What did he do? He shut others out. Listen to me carefully. Is God a God of love? Yes. Is God good? Yes. Is he merciful? Yes. But God has limits. God has limits because he hates sin. When he shut Noah in, he automatically shut the others out and they drowned. When God called Lot out of Sodom, the instant Lot left and was clear what God did, he sent a fire. Let me say it again. God has limits to his patience. But God is so long-suffering that we misinterpret that to mean that he is indulgent. And you can just run a game on God and get away with anything you like. God does not function like that. If that were the case, there would have been no need to send Jesus. And so Jesus Christ is coming back as a conquering king, not as a priest to give people a second chance. All right. And so we're talking about time of the end and the end of time. And I was asking, what events come to mind when you hear end time events? And you told me the Sunday law, you told me uh, persecution, you t I mentioned the close of probation. Uh, someone said, no, nobody said the time of Jacob's trouble, which goes along with persecution. There's the little time of Jacob's trouble. There is the loud cry, which occurs before the close of probation and ends with the close of probation. Now, you're looking at me as though you're in a stupor, and I understand that. Now, I'm saying all of this to make this point. 
When we think of end time events, we take a very impersonal view. The papacy will do that. That has nothing to do with me. The Illuminati will do that. Nothing to do with me. Uh, the, the false prophet will set up an image of the beast. Nothing to do with me. There will be a Sunday law. I'm not involved in passing it. Nothing to do with me when we think of end time events. But I want you to look at the personal side of what? Prophecy. Or the personal side of end time events. Then you tell me if it has anything to do with you or with us. Let's pray again. Father in heaven, as I come to the more graspable and understandable part of the message, double the portion of your spirit upon me, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, 1225. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're getting personal now. I'm about to get into your business without your permission. But you, the thing about being a preacher, you don't need permission, you see. You just do it because you have divine authority. Do you have 2 Timothy? You know, Timothy was a teenager when Paul chose him to lead churches. You didn't know what I said. We live in an age where young people, or many of us think to be young is to be frivolous and to just play video games and giggle all day. No. Timothy was a teenager when Paul called him to lead churches. Young people can be given heavy responsibilities, but they must be trained. Are you with me? So don't underestimate young people. Don't underestimate children. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. If you have my version, read it with me. What does it say? This know also, that in the last days, stop. Give me a synonym for the last days. Based on what I've been saying. End of time. Time of the end. Mm -hmm. This know also, that in the last days, now question for you, when will the last days come? They're here. <laughs> stop looking so shocked. The last days are with us. This know also that in the last days, keep reading, perilous times shall come. They have come. Keep reading. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Ah, is this end time prophecy, yes or no? Yes. Now this is not the close of probation. You see, that's distant from me. This is not the papacy doing something that's distant from me. This is not the Illuminati that's distant from me. Now this attacks me. Men shall be lovers of their own selves putting themselves above the work of the church. Question for you and me, but don't answer me. Does that apply to you? Now you can say the Illuminati does not apply to me. The close of probation does not apply to me. But when the Bible says an end time event is people loving themselves, does that apply to us? Don't answer me. Men shall be lovers of their own self, Covetous. Stop. Everything you see, you want. Do you know, if we would obey commandment 10, we'd eliminate a lot of problems. By the way, what is commandment 10? Thou shalt not covet. There'd be a lot of financial problems eliminated. If we would obey commandment 10, thou shalt not covet. This know also that in the last days perilous time shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own self, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. Does that apply to any of us? Are we proud? Do we brag? Do we boast? Disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. These are end time events. And they're personal. Have you ever heard someone preach about these things as end time events? Because we don't consider end time events as personal issues. We consider them as national and international issues. Like the close of probation. And whatever the papacy and the beast forms an image to the beast and all that kind of thing which will all happen and is happening. But the personal side 
the embarrassing side that compels us to look at ourselves, we never consider that part of end time events. Let me read the verse again. This know also Paul is saying, don't be, know it, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. You know, I read the news or watch the news on iPad. It's, I'm surprised at how many people are killing family members. How many mothers are killing their babies? or dumping them. It seems to me I've lived long enough to realize I can compare the 70s with the 2000s. Are you following me? You didn't hear that that often. This 14-year-old boy just killed five family members a few days ago. Bam, 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 bam. Perilous times. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. Let me pause on blasphemers. Go to Matthew 12. <laughs> Let's pause on blasphemers. Let's introduce a blasphemy nobody thinks about, but is sweeping the church. Matthew 12, let's read from verse 31. What's our subject? Uh-huh, and it's 12, 31. Do you have Matthew 12? What's our verse, 31? And by the way, the clock says 12, uh, 31, so good time to go to that verse. Do, are you there? Let's pray. Father in heaven, as I continue, suppress self and let only the Spirit speak, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Read verse 31 from what does the Bible say? Wherefore, I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy, come on, shall be forgiven unto men. Now, pause. All manner of sin and blasphemy. Of course, there's an exception to everything shall be forgiven unto men. Keep reading. But the blasphemy, come on, against the holy, come on, shall not be forgiven unto men. Stop. Any form of blasphemy you and I commit can be forgiven except blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Keep reading. And whosoever speaketh a word against the it shall be forgiven him. Keep reading. But whoso speaketh against the Holy Ghost, come on, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Pause. This is serious. The Bible says you say something against Jesus. And what can you expect? Now we can extend that to the Father. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, he that hateth me hateth my Father also. Whatever happens to Jesus, same with the Father. But if you speak against the Holy Ghost, there is no forgiveness in this life. Mm -hmm. There is a teaching in the Adventist church. It's not an official teaching for those of you who are guests. Not an official teaching. That the Holy Ghost is not a person. That's like calling me an animal. And I wouldn't like it. Are you following me? There is a popular teaching in this church. It's called anti-Trinitarianism. Where there's no trinity, the Holy Ghost is not an individual, an intelligent being. It is widespread. I use the word widespread carefully. I have seen it wherever I have gone. For those listening who may share that kind of teaching, blasphemy against the Holy Ghost has no forgiveness. You blaspheme Jesus, there's forgiveness. You blaspheme the Father, there's forgiveness. You blaspheme the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says, you tell me, there's no forgiveness. Because you're blaspheming the very person who convicts you of your sin. You didn't get what I said. It is not Christ who convicts you or the Father. It is the Holy Spirit. That's his work. Are you following me? It wasn't the Father who died on the cross. It was Christ. It wasn't the Holy Ghost who rose from the grave. It was Jesus. It wasn't the Holy Ghost who sent Christ. It was the Father. They have different functions. The Holy Spirit is, based on what I read in the Bible, the most sensitive of the three. So if you're running around preaching, the Holy Ghost is not an individual, an intelligent personality. Stop for the sake of your own salvation. 
Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Let's pause on unthankful, see if it applies to us. Would you like a bigger house? <laughs> you know where I'm going, so you're saying no. <laughs> you're too slick for the preacher. Would you like a bit? Yes. You know there are people who would like the house you have now. In my travels, I have seen people live in places, and I say, Father, somebody lives there? The answer is yes. I was in a certain country. I don't want to call the country's name, even though everybody knows. And I was walking down the city with a, one of the locals, and right on the sidewalk were people living. They took a piece of a tarpaulin, what do you call it, like tent material, put some stones on one end, piece of stick on the other end, and crawl under. That's where they live on the sidewalk. Now, right next to that, I saw a little structure like a cabinet where you put your clothes in our houses, just for clothes. The lower section was a family. The upper section was a family. And I said, jeez. I just shook my head and thanked God for my shack. Are you following me? Unthankful. The Bible says in everything, give thanks. Let me ask you this. I said it last Sabbath, I'll say it again. Are you grateful for vision? Would you like to lose it? Which of these little fingers would you like to lose of these ten? You have ten. Come on, you can lose one. Ten toes, you can lose one. Mm -mm. You have two eyes, which one would you like to lose? Not one. Would you like to lose one of these? No. How about having this one stopped up? No. Are we thankful to God for his constant preservation of our lives? You heard me, probably heard me say it. In the winter, I hate shoveling snow. I know, I've never met someone who loves to shovel snow. But here's how I literally shovel snow. Thank you, Father, for the physical ability <laughs> to shovel snow. Mm -hmm. Because every winter, people collapse from heart attacks, shoveling snow. And so I find a way to see something spiritual, and I thank God I can shovel snow. We must be thankful people. Do you thank God we still enjoy freedom of worship? Do you know there are Christians being killed around the world in certain countries? Churches bulldozed, houses burned down, they persecuted, losing their lives because those countries do not guarantee freedom of worship. United States, we complain about the police, but you call them, they come. If your cat is stuck with a tree, you call the fire department, it comes and gets down your mangy cat. Are you with me? <laughs> huh? You go to some countries and you tell them that they cannot understand what you're saying. You call the fire department to get a cat out of a tree, it makes no sense to them. You call the police, they tell you, come and get us. Because we have no transportation. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Be thankful for God's blessings. Unthankful. Unholy. Well, let me not get on to unholy. I'll let you work that out yourselves. Go to verse 3. Without natural affection. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent fierce, despisers of those that are good. What do you understand by fierce? There's some Christians, let's deal with the Christians, they are quick to fight. Mm -hmm. They will fight at a drop, well, a hat or a hat pin. I mean, angry people. You say one thing wrong, step on a toe or a toenail, and you've got a fight on your hands. A literal fight. They are fierce. They like that peace that passeth all understanding. The Bible says in the last days. Now keep in mind, Paul is writing to the church. Are you following me? So when you read... This know also in the last days perilous time shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. He means in the church.
without natural affection. Love no one and love nothing. Traitors, verse 4, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Let me ask you this and tell the truth. Well, no, you don't need to tell the truth. Well, yes, you should, but you don't need to answer this question. But you need to tell the truth. If the church arranges a Bible study and a basketball game on separate nights, you will have more people, finish my words, at the basketball game than at the Bible study. Guaranteed. You arrange a service on one night, you arrange a banquet on another night. You will have more people at the banquet than at the service. But everybody loves Jesus. Lovers of pleasure. When we were driving in, Mavis and I, we saw long lines of cars. And Mavis said, is this football South Sunday? I said, I thought they were playing out of town. But apparently, I believe, are they playing at the stadium today? Okay. Yeah, they, okay. So we saw these long lines. Now, have you ever seen a long line of cars trying to get to Ipsy? <laughs> <clears throat> or Conant? <laughs> Or London? No. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. The football season just began. The playoffs will be in November, December. When playoff time comes, people camp on the sidewalk to get tickets. Super Bowl, people fly from all over the world in the country to come in to watch 22 men fall down and get up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now you tell them come to church, and they're not coming, but they're Christians. There's a city called Green Bay, one of the most famous football teams, the Green Bay Packers. It gets cold in Green Bay, and yet, and it's an outdoor stadium. <laughs> that place is packed. <laughs> And it's 20 below. Now you heat up a church 20 above. <laughs> Are you with me? And nobody comes. But you ask them if they love Jesus. Yes, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Yeah. Notice the Bible doesn't say, this not also in the last days, perilous. men shall be murderers and robbers and hijackers. That's too obvious. Aye, the personal side of prophecy. Let's look at verse 5. Read that verse for me. Yeah. Having a form of godliness. Come on. But denying the power thereof. Finish the verse. From such. Mm -hmm. He's talking to the church. You don't tell the unbeliever having a form of godliness. The church. Paul is saying there are members in the church who will have the form. They will go through the rituals. They'll go through the motions, but there is nothing. And he says, avoid them. Now, I'm not here to tell you how to identify them. That's your work in God. But one of the end time developments will be church members who have only the form and not the power. But let's see how it's expressed. Having a form of godliness, finish the verse, and denying. That's active. I'll go to church two hours a week, but that's it. Don't ask me to do this for the church. Don't ask me for money. Don't ask me for this. Don't do that. Don't look. I'll come two hours to keep up a tradition and then leave me alone. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. It's almost quarter to one. I'm about to bring an end to your misery. 1 Timothy chapter 4. We go from verse 1. We were in 2 Timothy. Now we're going to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Do you have that? Let's pray, Father in heaven, I'm coming to the end. Please continue to be with me, please. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. First Timothy 4, let's read verse 1. <clears throat> Are you there? Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Stop. What is expressly? Explicit. Give me another word. 
clearly, directly, you can't miss it. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, read with me now, that in the latter times, start, what's the latter times? The last days now, and times. Keep reading, some shall depart from the faith. Stop. Is he referring to the world? The world doesn't depart from the faith. The church. Do you know people who've left the church? But this departure is becoming more and more voluminous. In the 1980s, dozens and dozens of ministers left the church following a man called Desmond Ford. I heard someone told me a couple of uh, weeks ago, this minister took his daughter to Benny Hinn, SDA minister, to be prayed for. She wanted to go, so he went. And when he went, he became, in quotation marks, converted and became a follower of Benny Hinn. An SDA preacher. There's an SDA preacher who used to work in Michigan. Nice fellow. I pray for him. Started preaching against the Holy Spirit and the Trinity. Now has his own anti-Trinitarian movement. They have the camp meetings. And now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. What is the faith? What is found between these pages. Keep reading. See how serious it is. Giving heed to seducing spirits, come on, and doctrines of devil. Now, what is a doctrine of devils? Anything that is not from God's word is a doctrine of the devil, including... What's the most, there are two teachings that are most popular in Christianity that are contrary to the Bible. One, dead people are not really dead. And two, that is the Sunday is the Sabbath. Neither one can be supported by the Bible. And I hit this very often. Very often. I'll hit it continually as long as I have life. There isn't one Bible verse that teaches the first day of the week is holy. Not one. But it's popular. Doctrine of a devil. Let me talk about the devil. No, not the devil, but... This concept of doctrine of the devil, you don't have to say, devil, I accept you in order to follow him. You just have to ignore God. You're not following me. You simply have to, you see, ignoring God is effectively saying, I accept the enemy. You don't have to be a mass murderer. Mm -mm. Your affections simply have to be removed from God. And you become a child of the enemy. Every soul that refuses to give himself to God is under the control of another power. Satan takes control of every mind that is not decidedly under the control of the Spirit of God. Listen again. Satan takes control of every mind that is not decidedly. What does decidedly mean? 100%. Completely. Entirely under the control of the Spirit of Christ. The devil takes control. Which means the devil controls a lot of people in church. The man with the, with the, 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 the demon, you know, Christ would go into the synagogues and demons would cry out. You know why? There were demons in the members. Ah, you didn't hear what I said. Christ would walk into a synagogue and demons would cry out that had never cried out before. Because in Christ, they came face to face with pure, absolute truth. And they cried out. Jesus said in Matthew 13, verse 30, let them grow together until the time of the harvest. Referring to what? The wheat and the tares. Now, when the servant asked, Lord, who has done this? The master said, the enemy has done this. The, the Jesus explained, the enemy is Satan. Satan plants people in the church. He converts them. And they come into the church. But before Christ comes, they'll go right back out. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. Never leave the church. Amen. 
You know why? Not because we have pipe organs, we don't. Not because we have the best facilities, we don't. But what we teach is biblical. Let me close with this thought. Some shall depart from the faith. Go to John 6. Let's see people departing from the faith 2,000 years ago. If it happened then, it'd be worse now. John 6, let's read from verse 66. 10 to 1. Do you have John 66? Not 66, sorry. John 6, verse 66. Our subject, the personal side of prophecy. Are you there? Let's read. What does that say? From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They left Jesus. Disciples left him. Now, why did they leave him? They did not like what he said. Read verse 61. What does that say? When Jesus knew in himself that they murmured at it, he said what? Does this offend you? Mm -hmm. Truth sometimes offends. I have seen people get up and walk out while I was preaching. Especially when I talk about the state of the dead, seven-day Sabbath. Get up and walk out. I was conducted a revival or a crusade in Detroit about almost 20 years ago when this church was set up, mustard seed, now uh, Highland Park. And this lady came every night for the first week. I didn't see her, so I called her. What happened? She said, Elder Skeet, I cannot sit under that preaching and not make a decision. So I decided not to come back. She left because what I was saying was bothering her. The Bible says from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Why? Because what he said offended them. Read verse 67. Nice and loud. What does that say? Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? In other words, only the twelve remained. Notice verse 66. From that time, what's the next word? Many. You know, Jesus had many disciples beside the twelve. We only know the names of the twelve. But the many left. And they left in such numbers that Jesus turned around and all he saw were the twelve. And so he asked them, are you leaving as well? Read the next verse and say hallelujah. What does Peter say? Read the next verse. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words, come on. Of the, ah, question for you. Why did Peter say they were staying? Because of what Jesus was teaching. People go to churches for all kinds of reasons. That's the church my grandmother went to. Well, God bless your grandmother. But if it's teaching error, don't go. That's the church I was baptized in or christened in. That's nice. But now you've learned something. Make a decision. Peter said, we are staying because you have the words of eternal life. We are staying because of what you teach. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the last days some shall depart from the faith. My brothers and sisters, we're in the end time. Let's for a while put aside what the papacy is doing and the Illuminati and the beast and whatever else. Let's look at us. In my walk with Christ, am I fulfilling negative prophecy? You see, there's positive prophecy and negative prophecy. The negative is men shall be proud, lovers of their own self, boasters, blasphemers, disobedient. That's negative prophecy. Am I fulfilling negative prophecy? That's the personal side of prophecy. It is virtually, it is as much an end time event as the close of probation. And so I give you these words again. You think as I read the word. This know also that in the last days perilous time shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own self, covetous, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, 
unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. If one of those applies to us, we need to make a decision right now. Father, take that from me. Take that from me. Let no negative prophecy be fulfilled in me. Instead, let's think of Revelation 2.10, he that endureth unto the end, and, uh, uh, Matthew 24, 14, the same shall be saved, 13 and 14. Or Revelation 2.10, be thou faithful unto death, mm -hmm. and I will give thee, a, let that be in me. A young man has been writing me for weeks now. He's attending school in a certain country, I won't say what country, but he's from a different country. A very poor family. I don't know how he got my information, but he wrote me on WhatsApp. Pray for me. He's attending a school, and everything is on Sabbath. Now, his government gave him a scholarship. He's a poor, from a poor family, he said. There is no way he could have attended college without that scholarship. What do I do? I said, don't do it. And he keeps writing me. He said, I want to obey my God, even though I know it will disappoint my entire family and the very country I come from, because where else will I get this opportunity? All fees paid, all expenses paid, but classes on Sabbath, exams on Sabbath. He said, all the Adventists virtually at that school are going to school on Sabbath, taking exams on Sabbath, and he does not want to do that. So this official meets with him, and that official meets, and he will not go to class on Sabbath. Now what am I supposed to tell him? Well, go on Sabbath. No, I don't go. What will happen? I don't know. God will make a way. That's God's speciality. Think of Daniel. Daniel could have closed his window and prayed. Are you with me? He left it open. The three Hebrew boys could have bowed, gotten up and said, Lord, I'm sorry, because with God is plenteous forgiveness. Are you following me? But they didn't. Joseph could have said a part of his wife, okay, okay, but let's just do it once. He didn't. And they paid. Joseph paid the consequence. And so my counsel to him is, be thou faithful unto death. Question for you at five to one. Are you willing to die for Christ? Don't answer me. Don't answer. Are you willing, if you're willing to take an exam on Sabbath, how can you be willing to die for Jesus? Are you following me? If you can't give up working on Sabbath, why would you be willing to die for God? It makes no sense. We do not understand that these little challenges are preparing us for bigger ones to come. The personal side of prophecy. Based on what I've said, does anyone need to say, Father, I need to make a change in my life? If you need to say that, can I see your hand? I need to make a change in some area of my life. Stand up with me. I need to make a change in some area of my life. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Is that the area? Covetous? Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent fears, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From Which one of those applies to us? Only one needs to apply. For us to be in danger of losing eternal life. The Bible tells us Adam committed one sin we know about and God put him out. And you're standing to say, Father, I need to make a change in some area of my life. Let me not fulfill negative prophecy. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father in heaven, thank you for your word which sometimes is disturbing, unsettling, and embarrassing, rebuking, and offending. But it always saves if it's obeyed. We thank you, Father, for the very clear word. This know also that in the last days, perilous time shall come. And Paul listed 
human characteristics. He didn't say floods, earthquakes, even though will come, and disasters. He mentioned personal characteristics as part of end time events. Dear God, from the pulpit to the pew, if any of those applies to us, let us take action with the help of the Spirit of God so that in us might be fulfilled positive prophecy that there will be a people who will be faithful to God even unto death. And while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, let me ask you quickly and clearly, if there's someone listening to me, you have drifted from God, and you know it, you have drifted from God, and you'd like to say, Father, I'm making a serious decision now to come back. Before I drift so far that coming back becomes impossible. Listen again. If there is someone listening, you have drifted from God. And you want to say, Father, I make this decision today to come back to you. And hold me, dear God, so that I never drift again. If this applies to someone, just raise your hand where you are. You know you have drifted from God. Just keep your hand up where you are. I won't call you. Stay where you are. I have drifted from God. You can drift from God while coming to church 365 days a year. Father, look at the hands raised. The hands are raised. You know the hearts of those who have raised their hands. In the name of Jesus Christ, dear God, give them that spiritual power. Give them that determination, Father, as they choose to come back to you. That determination that will keep them in your hands, keep them in your care, keep them in your embrace so that no power on earth will induce them again to drift. Dear God, increase our love for you. Increase our hatred for the world and the things of the world. Let positive prophecy be fulfilled in us. And dear God, when you come with your Son, save us, I pray, from my heart. In Jesus' name and for his sake, let God's people say, Amen. And amen. Our closing hymn, Shall We Gather the River? Hymn 432, Shall We Gather at the River? Let's remain standing as we sing. <laughs>